This is a podcast about a college athlete and a guy that definitely would not have talked to her in college. Now they get paid to talk to each other broadcasting basketball games, although they don't get paid to do this podcast yet. We've been renewed for a third week for some reason. Welcome in to the third episode of The Athlete and the Guy Who Would Not Have Talked to Her in College. I'm Megan McEwen, and I'm the athlete. I am Joel. I am the guy that would not have talked to her in college, which I've since found out, like, everybody keeps saying, why would you not have spoken to Megan? She's very nice. She's so nice. I know. Someone said I was so kind the other day, and I was like, I did not know that was my reputation. I'm so honored that, because I have resting uh, bitch face, apparently. I don't know if we can say the B word on this show, but yeah, it's a show I, I have a resting, apparently I, do I look mean? I, I, I don't know what happened. I thought there was a glitch. <laughs> I can't handle it. So anyways, I'm very happy that um, that seems to be my reputation. Maybe I'm just paying all these people like Lori Laughlin did, which we're going to get to later on the show. Very excited to break that out of the pop culture segment. Um, but yeah, happy to be here for the third episode. All right, a lot to get into. We will talk about Lori Laughlin. Uh, we will also talk to Chris Pica, who used to be the PR director for the Birmingham Barons when Michael Jordan played for the Birmingham Barons. So on the heels of The Last Dance, we'll talk a little bit about MJ in his baseball career. We will talk about baseball because last week we broke it all down with Jared Diamond. This week we break down the proposed health precautions that baseball has come out with. Some of them are awesome. But we start, Megan McEwen, it is race week or at least it should be. I'm bummed. So I worked in Indianapolis for three and a half, four years, and the Indianapolis 500 is every Sunday Memorial Day weekend. And by far my most favorite event I've ever covered in my life, I don't know what could top it, um, just a really great day for the city of Indianapolis and for Speedway and the track, it's such a tradition. And a bummer, it has been moved to August due to COVID. Um, so, we had a chance to sit down earlier this week with Katie Hargett, who is a um, IndyCar and TT series reporter. And she also works at the Speedway during the month of May. And she had some great insight into what the IndyCar series is looking to do and how they're going to handle the Indianapolis 500. Do you think football is still fun? Zero fun, so basically I like outdoor sports. But in the world. Uh, sports have their place too. So good to see your faces again. It's been years since I've seen Joel at Ball State, and it feels like it's been years since I've seen you, Megan. I know, since our last padded shoe uh, brunch before <laughs> I moved back to Chicago. So, um, yeah, it's wild. But I know this is like your. Hang on, hang on. Did you get the cinnamon toast? Megan did, didn't you? Duh. Okay. Just, Always. Sorry, just checking. Always. I really went on a rant on a side note the other day to somebody about how Patachu is the greatest establishment to eat on the face of the planet. I've yet to find somewhere even close in Chicago, which is supposed to be like, you know, this is massive. Wow. That's a bold statement. Bold statement. So Um, aside, but quickly, before we get into racing, uh, when my parents visit me in Indianapolis, my mother will eat at Patachu for breakfast every day they're here. Even if they have breakfast at the hotel, she'll still go to Patachu sometimes five days in a row. You have to, because the coffee is so good. I mean, like I should be an ad. My goal in life is to have an omelet there named after me. That's That's just where I'm going with. And I know um, a lot of IndyCar drivers' goals in life, look at that transition, (laughs) is to kiss the bricks and win the Indianapolis 500. So Katie, COVID has affected everybody in every way, shape, or form. And form. What was your initial reaction when you heard that the race was not going to be canceled, but was going to be moved to the uh, to August? So I still kind of get like an eerie feeling talking about this because I was already down in St. Pete. We were ready to kick off the season when the U.S. like shut down so i was actually at the racetrack and in a meeting in a broadcast meeting getting ready to prepare for the first indy lights race of the season and for um those of you that aren't really into indycar indy lights is our feeder series so it's like the triple a of indycar and we were getting ready to kick off our race season there were cars on track all of a sudden our producer gets a call uh we're shutting down the track no race and I was like, wait, what do you mean? What do you mean no race? We were going to race without fans. Everything was, we had a plan. Um, 
so that quickly got shut down. I went back to my in-laws uh, who li thankfully live there in St. Pete. And we just immediately started getting all of these, you know, notes about everything else that was shutting down across the country and didn't know what that meant for the future of IndyCar. I came home that weekend a few days later thinking, we're not going to have a season. Um, and, you know, thankfully, Roger Penske was so quick to jump on the rest of the season. He took over the NTT IndyCar Series this year. And I know a lot of people are really thankful that we have such an intelligent uh, businessman at the helm now because he jumped on it. And now we have a plan. Not only do we have a plan for the Indy 500 in August, but we have a plan to kick off the season. You know, NASCAR is getting started, PBR is bucking bulls. Um, so it's good to see sports back. But, you know, May in Indianapolis is not the same. I constantly check the date on the calendar because here it feels like it could still be, especially with the weather, <laughs> feels like it could still be March or April. What's the impact, Katie, of the move of the Indy 500 in particular? Um, for people that I'm, I'm not a racing aficionado, last year was my first 500. Um, Welcome. But, <laughs> right, right. Uh, I sat at the finish line. It was great. <laughs> um, I, I know. Well, yeah. um, How'd you pull that off? I knew a guy. I got very lucky. Uh, um, what's the impact of moving the race in, in terms of where it is in the course of the season? And does that matter? Does that impact things that it's now in August instead of May if the season is starting in, in possibly June? Yeah, so there was a time where we thought, oh my gosh, maybe the Indy 500 is going to be the first race of the season, you know, when things kind of went up in smoke, which made a lot of people nervous. I mean, the Indianapolis 500 has very high stakes and it can have potential to be also a pretty dangerous place to race. Um, so that was not what a lot of people wanted to see. And I'm very thankful that the rookies are going to get some experience outside of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway before you know, we get to the Indy 500. So kicking off the season in Texas in June, that's still a very high speed oval. But before we get to Indianapolis, we're going to have set, hopefully several other races. We're still planning to go to Road America and Wisconsin and uh, Toronto. Oh, I'm trying to name off races I know that haven't been moved. Um, so, you know, getting that handful of race experience before we get to Indianapolis is going to be really key, not only for these rookies to start to learn some things, but for those other drivers that now guys haven't been in the car for six months um, in a competitive way, more than six months. So um, I think it's, it's a great decision to be able to have these other races before Indianapolis. But um, in terms of the city, I really hope that we stay on track for what we would have done in, or excuse me, what we would have done in May. So normally what comes with the race is a month long of activities from kicking off with the Indy Grand Prix. Then we have this like fundraiser, huge cocktail event type party called Rev, which is the greatest party on the, on the planet. And then after Rev, we go straight into the week of practice and Carb Day and Fast Friday and all these really great iconic days um, at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And I know they're still trying to work out details. Uh, the 500 Festival, which works um, con in congruency with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, is doing things like holding virtual uh marathons that they you know would normally be doing the real thing we're still trying to find find out what it looks like to have a parade in town so it's all these really uplifting things that we're still hoping the city sees and um you know it's really cool too i live north of indianapolis now but i went to town today and there are still so many checkered flags out which i love and katie something i did not realize because i did not grow up in Indiana. In fact, I always joke about this because like, I did not know there was a difference between NASCAR and IndyCar until I moved and got my first job in Terre Haute. Like, okay, so like East Coast, like no clue, right? But I, it's funny, people ask me what my favorite thing I ever covered has been. And I will always say the Indianapolis 500 because like I get chills thinking about it, just yeah. the traditions that's behind it, 
um, what's at stake for the drivers. There's the sense of community in the city and the town. It, it's truly incredible. But you've touched on it a little earlier, the fact that, you know, the rookies are going to have a chance to get some races underneath their belts. The drivers in general are going to have a chance to get a little experience. People talk all the time about how dangerous the Indianapolis 500 is. Can you speak to why it's so important for these drivers to get a little bit of experience underneath their belts before going at it in the 500? And, and why is I mean, it so dangerous? Because I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's pretty simple, honestly. These guys are going. 230 miles an hour plus um and if you put it that way i feel like that really puts it in perspective not only are they going 230 miles an hour plus they're also centimeters away from each other so it is in less than a blink of an eye that something very dangerous can happen we look back to 2015 james hinchcliffe uh, a part broke on his car he wasn't even near anyone else a part broke on his car and um he can laugh about it now, but then I, I remember I was up in the spotter stand, watched it all happen. I get chills and have nightmares about the sound that his car made when it hit the wall. Um, but he was basically a shish kebab. I mean, the car went through one hip and out the other. Uh, two years ago, Sebastian Bourdain crashed in qualifying, shattered his hip, his pelvis, one of his legs. So there's always high stakes when you're running that fast and that close to someone else. And what I always picture is these guys are superheroes. I mean, real life superheroes. And we've made some changes to the car this year. We have um, a safety shield, kind of like a windshield. We call it an arrow screen, but a picture kind of like a, a windshield type thing on an Indy car. And it now makes them look like fighter jets. So imagine the blue angels, but with wheels. That's what the guy, these guys are. And something else I've always found really fascinating. So when I first got to Indianapolis, I was able to do a two-seater. And Mario Andretti was my driver, which was wait, like, wait, wait. Did you do it at, you did it at IMS? I did it at IMS. It was the road course. But OK, so funniest story. So he's like in there. And like Mario Andretti, for people who don't know, he's like, what, 5'4"? He's a, he's tiny. Yeah. If that, if that he's super tiny and someone said that's Mario Andretti. And so I went up to him and I was like, hi, uh, you're going to be driving me today. We're going to be safe, right? Like you're not going to kill me. And he looked at me and said, Oh, darling, I'm not going to die today. And I was like, all right, we're good. So I love how he said, I'm not going to die as if you yeah, were an yeah. accessory to the okay. equation. Thank you, Mr. Mario Andretti. <laughs> you make great wine by the way. Um, but I remember, like you get all the fire suit on, you like get the helmet on. And I got into the car. It is so claustrophobic. I had a panic attack. Mario Andretti is driving this car. I guess like, I have to get out. Let me out. Let me out. So I got out of the car and they were like, do you not want to go? I was like, I need a minute. And somebody else like went and then I came back and they were like, okay. I was like, I have to do this once. This is the once in a lifetime opportunity. And so I got in and Mario said, we'll only go one lap. So we did no. one lap which is all I needed. My point of my story being the amount of G's that the forces when you are driving in these things, like these drivers are true athletes. You have to be in such great shape. Your coordination has to be there. Like I thought I was going to pass out afterwards. So like to put it in perspective, like imagine going 230 miles an hour and having to make quick decisions, like, and literally like your hands are just doing all the work. I, I have so much respect for how much of a, um, athletic ability it takes to be an indie car driver i mean the only other thing i can compare it to is imagine being on a roller coaster you're driving the roller coaster and someone else is driving a roller coaster right next to you um i mean they're also oh on top of this they don't have power steering so the shape those guys have to be in i mean tony Kanan did a live zoom today for indycar and talked about his workout regimen Okay, are you ready for this? Gets up at five o'clock, maybe earlier because he has four kids, right? So got to get up for the kids, get your workout in. Normal person would just go about their day, right? No, no. Tony Kanan also gets in another workout while his kids are having their afternoon nap and another one after dinner. <laughs> That's insane. And he's like in his late 30s, early 40s, right? Oh, he's in his 40s. Yeah. And he's a great interview, by the way. <laughs> yeah great interview he is wow so how how normal 
do you expect this August race to be when the time comes? I don't know if we know what normal is anymore. Um, you know, I saw pictures on Twitter of the IMS staff walking the governor and his team through procedures of what it would look like to get into the facility. Um, and it included stickers on the ground that said, stand here as you are walking into gate one. So I don't know if we can e say anything like that yet. Um, you know, I, I imagine that our world moving forward involves a lot of masks, a lot of hand sanitizers, a lot of hand washing. Um, thankfully, one of Roger Penske's first projects at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway was upgrading the bathrooms. Mr. Penske, thank you. It's about time. He was on they were some ratchet bathrooms. Like, <laughs> I always made sure I'd go up to the media center on the third floor, which is actually where I always ran into Katie. Be like, oh, hey, oh, hi. Makes Sorry. sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, the other thing is you can't stop a race fan. <laughs> Look, a lot of these fans that come on race day don't attend another race ever, but their family has had those tickets for over 50 years and, you know, they'll be darned if they miss that race. So the Indy 500 brings out the most loyal people, uh, and, I have faith that they will be in those stands when that green flag flies. Are there ways that they've, and I don't know, this is how far down the road this would be either, but are, are there ways they've talked about bringing an experience to fans maybe at home? I'm just thinking from a, you know, being able to listen into different radios and not be at the track to do that. So you can sit at home, watch it on TV and still get that same experience that you would have otherwise. So the other cool thing about IndyCar is we already have that. Um, All right. <laughs> on our app uh, and not a lot of people know this you know it's not something that I think a lot of fans take advantage of and they sh certainly should I do for I never go to Texas uh, just by nature of the other events that coordinate um, and the Texas track itself so every year during Texas I scan driver radios on my phone uh, from our app so that's something that is really beneficial and a cool experience that fans can have and act as if they were at the track, but they're really sitting at home on their own comfy couch. Wow. It's probably a lot cheaper than what you have to pay to actually rent the radio on race day too. Shh, we're not telling anyone that. <laughs> right? Just kidding. And Katie, I know when August comes, people, fans will be able to see you at IMS up on the big screen if fans are allowed in if whatever that might look like, but how can people um, follow what you're up to? So it's pretty simple too. I'm boring. Katie Hargit on every form of social media. Um, H-A-R-G-I-T-T -T, though. <laughs> um, so yeah, I stay pretty active on every form of social media and I love hearing from race fans. And uh, one of my favorite things is hearing stories of those race fans that I mentioned that have had decades of tickets at the Indianapolis 500. Best story of that note that you've gotten. Oh man. I mean, there's one family that sits high up in turn two. They've had those same tickets for so long and Another really cool thing is, Megan, you might remember this. When they took out the old uh, green chairs at IMS, um, the stands used to be green chairs, those ticket holders could have had a chance to get hold of those green chairs. So that was another uh, really cool benefit for those families that had had those chairs uh, for so long. Best back porch ever. <laughs> yes. Uh, mine is my office chair. That's cool. That's cool. Yes, I'm not in my office right now. Though. <laughs> Sadly. Hopefully soon. Yes. All right, Megan, your favorite thing. What are you missing? Well, you don't live here anymore, but what would you be missing most about the Indy 500 if you were here this week? First and foremost, I loved waking up in the morning. I would, well, the best part about working the Indy 500 for me in the month of May was when I worked at Wish TV, I always had the night shift. So I would work from like 3 p.m. to midnight. During the month of May, I got to work a day shift. So I'd be done by like five or six o'clock and I got to go have a social life, like, and go to bars and like hang out with people. It was the best month ever. And then on the weekends, I got to work the morning show. So I got off at like three or four o'clock. So I was living the life working this um, on a personal selfish note. However, what Sorry I'm going to- Sorry for your pain, yeah. 
Yeah, well, this has turned into a therapy session. Um, <laughs> that being said, I just I can't begin to tell you how cool it is to see hundreds of thousands of people standing for the national anthem and the flyover and God bless America. And just like the chills I get when hearing the national anthem and just the whole entire setup of the drivers with all their crews and their family and everyone standing and then the fighter jets fly over. And it's just like, I get chills talking about it. That's what I'm going to miss most. Just seeing that incredible tradition. And honestly, who knows when we're ever going to be around that many people in the near future. So those memories I think are very fond for me. Was your first Indy 500 your first one working in the Indy 500 or had you been as a fan? No, that was my first one working in the Indy 500. And I got to interview Patrick Dempsey, McDreamy from Grey's Anatomy, which I was very excited about. 16-year-old Megan would have done backflips. That's more important than the race. 100%. So my story, I did not get to meet McDreamy. Um, I'm not a big racing person. Like, admittedly, I just it's not my jam. I went a couple of years ago to pole day just on my own. So... Ball State usually is in the Mid-American Conference baseball tournament uh, that week and into the weekend. So I never know my schedule. Um, A couple of years ago, they got bounced early. So I was home that weekend. I didn't expect to be. So I went to pole day myself. And I just walked around the track. And I was like, all right, this is interesting, cool. Which is brave, by the way, because for those who do not know, the Indianapolis 500 practice days, pole days, carb day, it is one huge party. Yeah, but it wasn't nuts. Like, it was... Like, you could walk around, like, the, obviously nothing's... Well, they pretty tame. Yeah, like, it was really tame. Um, so, like, it was interesting just to get that vibe. And I said to myself, if that's all I ever get, then cool. But last year, I had a friend of mine who reached out to me and said, have you ever been? I said, no. He said, I have an extra ticket. And as we talked about with Katie, it was at the finish line. So we sat at the finish line. However... Ball State was in the Mid-American Conference baseball tournament, so I didn't know if I was going to be able to get there. Well, Ball State gets eliminated the night game on Saturday night in the semifinals. Oh, my gosh. So the Cardinals lose in Cleveland, Ohio, lose at 11 p.m. Saturday night. My friend says, I will pick you up from – or no, he said, we'll leave from my house at 7 a.m. on Sunday. So eight hours from the time the game ended. I'm in Cleveland, five and a half hours away. I looked at our SID and I said, and I, it, like it didn't, like the math didn't click. So I looked at our SID and I said, Josh, I got bad news for you, man. Um, we have to leave now. Like, <laughs> I was like, we can't stay at the hotel and leave in the morning. Because, whoops, I didn't figure this out right. So uh, we drove through the night. I drove most of the way, I think, through the night because I was doing this to him. Um, And then I slept for like an hour and a half, maybe. Um, Went to my buddies. uh, You know, we all carpooled over. We went to the track. Luckily, on the way in, Five Hour Energy had a giant, like, fan stand. And I played some games and won a couple shots of Five Hour Energy. So that was great. But... I actually, going on an hour and a half of sleep, passed out in the stands from like lap 50 to like lap 90, somewhere in that range, just fell asleep. Which you didn't miss much. No, but like, do you know how hard it is to fall asleep? Sitting up? Well, no, with that noise, like it's, there's a- You have earplugs? A thousand people with just- Like, impossible. Um, But I woke up for the exciting part, and I saw Simon Pagino win, and I was right there as he took the lead coming down the backstretch, and uh, it was awesome. I will say what's very cool about IndyCar, first off, the fact that you can fall asleep during a race and take a decent nap and wake up and still, like, not miss anything. Besides that fact, the, um, the drivers are so accessible during the month of May. You literally just walk right up to them and they're so willing to talk to you. And they understand that most people aren't huge racing aficionados, aficionados. Let's try that word again. Uh, so they're just really approachable and relatable. And I was so happy when Simon Pagino won because he was one of my favorite drivers that I covered. 
Yeah, I, I have to imagine it's one of those things where you just like to root for those guys because they're so relatable and they're so easy to talk to and so easy to cover. Um, it makes it a little bit more fun. And I know you're not supposed to pick favorites, but Pagano was one of my favorites. Yeah, but you don't. He has a dog named Norman. It's great. The dog goes everywhere with him. The interesting thing that Katie brought up, and this is the shame of not having the 500 in May, and hopefully everything does get replicated again in August, is just the, I mean, the sheer loss of people, of events, of money that's coming into Speedway, which is the town right outside Indianapolis or, or part of Indianapolis where, where the track is. Um, Greg Doyle had a really good piece in the Indy Star about the economic impact and how restaurants are hurting. Um, so hopefully that all comes back. But what I thought was cool was that Speedway is actually still going through with all of their race week events. And there's like, and Katie talked about some of the virtual stuff. So like, there's still some things going on. Um, but this was my favorite sentence of all time. It was Speedway's Chamber of Commerce couldn't be more pleased. It is sponsoring an It's Still May in Speedway competition, which pits homeowners against each other to see who has the raciest front yard display. I don't think that's what they meant. But it's what they said. <laughs> but it's what they said. So if anybody starts to put some inflatable dolls in their front yard, I don't think that's what they were shooting for. They were thinking more checkered flags, but sometimes words have multiple meanings. Hashtag date. All right, a handful of headlines we want to dive in depth with here. And Megan, we talked about the competition in Speedway to make your yard look the raciest. They meant in a race car fashion. Um, but on that note, I thought this was hilarious. Uh, an adult's uh, website, we won't use the name, we'll just say it's a pornographic website. It has submitted a bid of $10 million for the naming rights to the Mercedes-Benz Superdome in New Orleans. Mercedes-Benz is contract is coming up. It was signed in 2011, 10 years for between 50 to $60 million. Uh, so 10 million a year from a, an adult website. No, 15, 15 million. I'm sorry, I should have changed them five mil. Yeah. Uh, at what point do you say yes and take the money? <laughs> Well, first off, the fact that they even have $15 million to offer just shows where our society is as a whole when it comes to adult uh, websites. Secondly, I, it's, it's, it's legitimate work. The only other place I could see something like this happening is Las Vegas. So this happening in New Orleans, first off, it's hysterical. Second off, not a shot it happens. Third off, that gives Mardi Gras a whole new meaning. Can you imagine Jim Nance? <laughs> Hello, Hello friends. friends. Welcome into the pornographic dome. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> usually we do TMI at the end of the show. Yeah, you just, there you go. A little, little uh, extra, extra for you today. All right, let's get into the other sports news. More rule changes. Here's the proposal from Major League Baseball sent to the players this week um, asking about or, or proposing uh, sanitary regulations with the return of the sport. Megan, I want to run through some of these. Um, lockers would be six feet apart, potentially outdoors or in unused places of the stadium to keep with social distancing. Um, players could be sitting in the stands instead of the dugout to keep social distancing. No more bat boys, no high fives, fist bumps, hugs, tobacco, see uh, tobacco seeds, um, no finger licking, no touching the face to give signs. Uh, which this one's a popular one. Uh, no holding runners at first base it, um, until the pitch is thrown. So basically keep social distance unless, like until you can't. Um, discontinuing showers at the park. All right. Um, team can fly, but they suggest using smaller airports. I don't know where, like what, the Yankees gonna go to Poughkeepsie? Like I, um, I don't know. And the uh, mascots are banned from the field, which I think is the biggest shame. How dare the Philly Fanatic be impacted by this? My favorite part about a sporting event when I go as a fan is the mascot. So I think that's really a bummer. And what, let the Philly Fanatic socially distance. Come on, give him a shot. You're just like, you're just saying, no, it's not going to happen. Give him a chance to prove himself. Um, the craziest rule to me there is uh, you're taking away the sacred high five, which... 
how it's but here's the issue and here's what's going to happen like you know no spitting obviously they're talking about so like how, how do you monitor that like what if i high five somebody are you gonna like sue me what what happens i don't understand how they're going to can i secretly give you a high five when no one's watching like a hug is an automatic ejection a high five is a, a strike or a ball if you're the pitching team are you making this up or is that really what's happening? 100 percent making this up. That's actually kind of good though. <laughs> that like actually might work. I just think it's interesting that like it's so people are people I think are so outraged, but ultimately, like just don't high five people. Like I think we'll be okay. I don't I don't I don't know. The shower one though, I was watching Shark Tank the other day. Oh boy. And uh, there were a handful of former NFL players that had a a uh, like a baby wipe. Uh, called the shower pill and you oh, I, I've seen it I've actually I have one they, they didn't get a deal for it um, they didn't know their numbers well enough um, but yeah I like I shower pills for all I feel like that's great at the end of the day it's like AAU basketball it's like when they were teenagers playing you used to go and play four games no shower go a little McDonald's in between and you were good to go and no complaints out. Smell like a teenage boy who's playing. Relive your childhood, man. There, you have it too good in the majors. This is just the universe's way of saying, hey, go back to your roots and remember how good you have it now. Let's continue the baseball conversation. Uh, Michael Jordan played some baseball, one season of it to be exact. Took a break from basketball in 1994 when he joined the Chicago White Sox organization. He went to double A with the Birmingham Barons, then played in the Arizona Fall League as well before baseball went on strike and Michael went back to basketball. So we thought we would explore that one sliver of the last dance. And to do that, we found somebody who experienced it firsthand. Michael Jordan is our next guest. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Can you imagine? In the sweet. Chris Pica joins us now, the communications director for the Bahamas Bowl and the Pro Football Writers of America. In 1994, 1995, 1996, he was the director of media relations for the Birmingham Barons, the AA affiliate of the Chicago White Sox, and for a time, Michael Jordan's baseball home. Uh, Chris, thanks for cop uh, hopping on here. Great. Thank you very much for asking. Uh, how crazy was Michael Jordan being a baseball player? I think it's hard for people now to, to put it into sort of context. I mean, if, if LeBron James decided tomorrow he was done playing basketball and he wanted to play another sport, I think it'd probably be on par with that. Uh, as, as I like to say, this was, was pre-cell phone cameras, pre-24-hour internet, pre-social media, pre-TMZ, pre a lot of things that we're used to now in, in, this, in, in this world uh, that, that didn't really apply back in 1994. It was, you know, uh, I hate to use the quaint term, but it was a simpler time in a lot of ways. I thought Tito's interviews were interesting um, because he said, you know, you give Michael 1,500 at-bats, he would have been a major leaguer. Uh, what was your opinion of the way that he picked the game up later in the season? And, and how cool was it to watch that development? It was very cool to watch that development because you're watching somebody who hadn't played in 13 years, who is completely different, you know, used to a different way of playing a game, of preparing for a game, the daily grind of it. You know, basketball, you get some downtime in between days. You get to get on the plane. You may get a day off in the city. You know, I know they played more back-to-backs in those days in the NBA, not that they do now. Um, so it was a little bit different when you're having to play because in the minor leagues, you can play 28 consecutive days without a day off. The majors, you have to get a day off every 21. So it is a grind for those guys. Um, and it's picking up the nuances of the game. It's picking up the little things. And he sat in the dugout with our pitchers and other players and was trying to pick up, hey, is this a fastball? Is this a curve? Watching how infielders and outfielders were placed. Simple things, you know, he played the outfield, he played right field, played some in the left. It's the transfer of the ball when you get a base hit into the outfield and you're coming at it with your glove and you've got to make that transfer from the glove to the ball to throw to second or third. Those things are things that, you know, minor leaguers and major leaguers do a thousand times in their lives. For Michael, he had to pick that back up. And so uh, I think he did a really good job in, in, in getting there. Now to the other point about the major leagues, um, I think people have to remember where the White Sox were in 1995. 1994, they were one of the best teams in the majors. They were probably heading for the playoffs and probably would have been a favorite along with the Montreal Expos of the World Series. Um, in 95, the White Sox were horrible. Uh, you know, Gene Lamont was fired, I think, 30 games in. Terry Bevington took over as manager. So they weren't a very good ball club at all. 
Jerry Reinsdorf took a lot of grief about the cancellation of the World Series in 94. So the question then would be, would Michael Jordan at 32 years old, because he would have played the 95 season in Nashville AAA. I mean, that's finishing school at that point at 32. It's Fisher cut bait. But with his athletic skills and how much he improved in the Arizona Fall League, yeah, I mean, he's athletic enough. He could have been the 25th guy. I mean, there's a lot of people who could be the 25th guy on the major league roster coming out of the minor leagues. There's nothing to say that he could not have been a September call up in 95 or potentially on the roster in 96, depending on how he improved and how he finished the AAA. To that point, the only other athlete I could think of at this moment in time who's had a little bit of success when transitioning to baseball is Tim Tebow, going from football to playing in the minors. Can you speak to how difficult it is for these professional athletes who are dominant in one sport to switch over and have success in a sport like baseball where they're competing against players that have been playing their whole entire lives? To hit 202 at double A off the street. Right, and that's I think that's a great point, Joel. You know, he was probably 500 at bats behind most of the guys in the clubhouse he was with. What people didn't see was the fact that he was in the cage every day in underneath the clubhouse. Uh, pre-game, he'd be working on outfield skills and running and other things he needed to get. Then he'd get in the cage, he'd hit. After the game, if he had a three-hit game, he'd be back in the cage. You wanted to remember that feeling of, of what it was like to have those three hits and what he did right. And this was before – you know, video coaching really came into vogue a lot later where you could really, really break it down on what they were doing. Now these guys are scrutinized from 50 different angles, even in the minor leagues. And if he was having a bad night, he'd want to get in there and just try to figure out what he was doing wrong. You know, did his head get out of the way? Was, you know, what was he doing? Uh, on things like that. So, um, I mean, he was, he, was a, he was 500, 600 at-bats behind these guys, um, but he worked hard at it. He didn't, he didn't cheat the game. He never did. And I think Terry Francona, his manager, did a really good job because they were very close in age um, at the time. But I think Terry good, did a good job getting him acclimated. And in Tebow's case, he went to single A. Um, matter of fact, the, the, the club that he went to at Greensboro called me and talked a lot about the experience that we had with Michael to try to see how they wanted to handle how, how they wanted to handle Tim's experience. Um, but to go to Double A baseball, hit two hundred two. Yeah, okay. Everybody wants to make fun of two hundred two. The Mendoza line, that's fine. Great. He had three home runs, had 51 RBIs. He stole 30 bases and had seven game-winning hits. Okay, freakishly good athlete. Okay, you just can't do that. You and I or anybody else couldn't walk up the street at 31 and go in a Double A batter's box and hit that. Okay, he did, and that's a testament to the work he did and just sort of the just God-given ability that he had as as an athlete. Let's talk about the the media frenzy side of it. You talked about, you know, the folks from the Mets calling you to, to ask about how to handle Tebow. Um, I remember in the last dance, I think it was Jerry Reinsdorf who said like, we can't send him anywhere below double A. We don't have the facilities. And right. like Prince William, I've, I've been to Fitzner stadium. The press box is smaller than my kitchen Island. Um, what, what, uh, how crazy was it? Like what, what happened in your life during that summer? <laughs> Let me, let me set this up a little bit. You mentioned Prince William is one of the single-A affiliates. The other two single-A affiliates in 1994 was South Bend, Indiana, okay? The Silverhawks at that time. Wait, Way yeah. close to Chicago to put Michael there. The third choice in Hickory, North Carolina, in the backyard of where he went to college. It would have overwhelmed the staffs, basically. I mean, these are small stadiums, small clubhouses, um, you know, it, 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 it would have been a difficult situation for those stabs to be in. And then it all changed on March 31st when I came in at seven in the morning and my general manager, Bill Hardikoff, pulled me in the office and said, he's coming. And at that point, I, I, you know, and I think if you've seen on Twitter, I put a lot of those press releases up. I, I think it's probably the single most, the single biggest press release I've ever written in my life was saying Michael Jordan assigned to Birmingham. And this is, this is pre-cell phones, guys. We had six phone lines coming into the Barron's offices that were absolutely slammed the minute this information got out. I had to get on the fax machine phone. Remember fax machines? I had to get on that phone to call out to media outlets. Never mind sending out press releases and media advisories and everything else via the fax. I had to use that as my phone line out for about five days. I mean, I didn't have a cell phone. We didn't have those things. So you're... You know, we, we had 130 media on opening night, his first game there. He missed the first game in Birmingham, the Barons' first home game, because he had played in the Windy City Classic, uh, White Sox and the Cubs. 
So he played in our second game uh, on a Friday night. And, you know, we had 130, and that was with a regional telecast that was going through um, Birmingham and the Chicago. So that was part of the 130. But, I mean, it was it was absolutely nuts. I mean, I you know, several foreign countries, a lot of states, a lot of radio hits. I mean, it just – and, and unlike now, where you guys know this, I mean, even sports information staffs are larger than they've ever been. You're talking about five or six people. It was me and a part-time, part-time intern who was working on this, okay? So it's like one and a half people when I was home, and then when I traveled on the road, it was just me. So, you know, there, there was no rest or the weary at all over the course of 140 games. And inevitably, there's some guy who showed up as one of those 130 media members that just wanted to talk to the second baseman and, like – and. You're like, you got to wait over there, man. We got some other things going on today. Well, you know, Michael was great about that because by about midseason, he understood the circus had to stop in front of his locker most every night. But he would just look at these guys and say, hey, you know, so-and-so threw a three-hit shutout or this guy had three hits and a home run. Talk to those guys first. You want to talk to me? Great. Go over there and talk to them. Uh, You know, and I think, you know, I think Michael understood that, you know. Um, he didn't know who the baseball writers were, the, the major dailies that were wanting to come down. So what I told them was, I said, don't send your baseball writers to us. Boston Globe wanted to send Peter Gammons. I said, as nice as that would be, and he's welcome here. If you want something from Jordan, you're better off sending Jackie McMullen down to us. So Jackie, Jackie came down. Sam Smith came down from Chicago. Um, so the people he knew and recognized, they were going to be able to get more out of them. You know, we didn't open the clubhouses on the road. Our clubhouses in a lot of those places I mentioned earlier are just way too small. So it actually worked to our advantage. We said, listen, come to Birmingham. I can take care of you. I give you plenty of space. You can work upstairs in the press box during the day. No one will bug you. You've got a big clubhouse. You'll get everything you need. I won't, you know, you won't be getting in the way. So we were able to do a lot of what we were dealing with in terms of having these people come in and visit, um, having them in Birmingham over the course of the summer. And just imagine if the spaceship from Space Jam actually landed on your field in Birmingham and all the press that would have been around that. Yes, it would have been. I mean, and, and I and I and I say and I say this, and I have not watched the complete movie, part of which because the guy who who played uh, Newman in Seinfeld was the Baron's PR director in the movie. So I was told all about it uh, by by our staff in Birmingham. <laughs> Wayne that's Knight. Amazing, uh, Wayne, Wayne Knight played the Barons PR director in the movie uh, because that summer the writers had come into Birmingham for about a week. Uh, and so we hosted them there. And so it was. Hey, <laughs> you answered the question. You are much more handsome, by the way. They, they got that <laughs> casting wrong. Yeah, when, and bully, bully me. I heard about it. Okay. Trust when me. People, when people ask who would play you in a movie, do you respond now, Wayne Knight? No, no, it was too much Newman at that point. It was, it was like really anybody, some unknown. I didn't care who. <laughs> and I didn't and honestly, I didn't know that that was happening until the movie came out. I had no idea. That's too funny. So in hindsight, if you could pick who got to play you, who would you have picked? Oh God. Um, <laughs> the wow. answer was always Brad Pitt. Yeah, I know. I, I know. It, yeah, I would. I would love to say that. I only know in 1994 who would have, you know, who, who would have played, you know, the nondescript PR director in the middle of all this. But uh, yeah, it was, you know, you, you, strangely, you know, that year, that summer, late in that year, they're saying, hey, we want to get pictures of the stadium. You know, they want to recreate the Hoover Met. So we, t- I took Polaroid cameras. Okay, took Polaroids of every fence sign every sign in the ballpark views from center field looking in so they could recreate it and CGI. Now they could do it in like 15 minutes. In those days you had to give them everything and, you know, views of the clubhouse and, and, and everything else. I mean, I mean, think about that for a minute. It's, it's, it's just, it's strange to realize that one of the most unique seasons in the history of minor league baseball came through Birmingham in 1994. As I've told a lot of people at that point, there are two athletes who are the greatest athletes of the 20th century, most recognizable athletes. And greatest is a different, different discussion, okay? Muhammad Ali, Michael Jordan, two most recognizable athletes over the world. One of them sitting in our backyard. I mean, it, it was absolute madness. What was he like back then? I mean, I know you, you, you mentioned that he would basically defer to his teammates for, for interviews. Hey, make sure you talk to that guy who played well. I mean... There were stories in the documentary of, of how he interacted with guys. It, it seems like he wasn't Michael Jordan. It seemed like he was just, 
you know, generic outfielder who was trying to fit in with the guys. Is that fair? I, th I think it's fair. I think he worked really hard at the game, but he also understood that, you know, the guys in the clubhouse were looking at him differently. And I think there was a bit of a, an early factor of players trying to figure out who he was and what he was like. And of course, a lot of them had worked with him in spring training. So they, they knew that, you know, he was in there grinding. Um, the one thing he always said was he appreciated how much those guys worked because they didn't have near the amount of uh, talent's not the right word. They all were very talented to play at that level, but guys that had to really, really grind. Okay. To get better because they wanted a shot at the major leagues as opposed to his basketball days where the other, you know, 14 guys on the roster were all as were all world-class athletes in their own right. So he had, he learned a lot from them learning what it was like to have to struggle, have bad nights at the plate, have bad nights in the field. I mean, he had 11 errors in the outfield. A lot of, a lot of it was just trying to pick up the ball and, you know, and so he had a lot of human nights out there, but he would play ping pong with the players uh, during the day in the clubhouse. Uh, we had a, a Spanish player who, uh, was learning English. So Michael would pay him for a per word he would learn, you know, to help him, help him get better. Um, you know, he really, really wanted to fit in as a teammate. He was on the buses. He rode the buses with us. We didn't do anything separate. We had a separate, you know, every hotel we stayed at, these were not the NBA hotels. This was not the Ritz Carlton. This was not. It was the Ramada. <laughs> yeah. Ramada's holiday inns. But what we did was we worked with the hotels to get him a room there that was sort of set off so that we could, you know, cause we had security at every hotel, but we never had to move Michael over the course of the season anywhere else. So he was part of the team, you know, day in and day out. And the people in the Southern league, quite honestly, you see him in the hotels where they kept a respectful distance. It wasn't nearly the, you know, the crazy screaming or anything like that. I mean, he, you know, he was all business going to the bus, but um, you know, he, he just wanted to fit in and play baseball and learn the game. And I really honestly believe, you know, he did this because he, he and his dad, he played baseball as a kid. He and, he and his dad loved the game of baseball. And he wanted to honor his dad who had gone through, you know, after such a tragic event of having his father killed. Um, you know, he, he wanted to go back and, you know, he had done everything he thought he could do in basketball at that point. He wanted to do something different. And he, you know, like I said, he, he didn't cheat it. He, he worked really hard at it. Awesome. Chris, uh, it's, it's wild to think about uh, what that season would have been like for you. <laughs> Uh, it's wild even more to think about the what ifs if he had stuck with baseball and never gone back to basketball. Um, and it's just one of those unique offshoots of uh, who Michael Jordan was and what his story was. So we appreciate you coming on and, and diving into some history with us. Joel, Megan, thank you very much. Uh, enjoyed it. It was great to watch. It, it, it's still surreal to see it even in the last dance and see him in our uniform, you know. And when we went back to the Bulls, he wore 45, the number he wore in Birmingham. And, and you just – you think about all that for a minute and you realize, oh my God, we actually went through this. You know, us as a staff, uh, we talked about that. I think um, this was, we all know major league staffs, right? And we all worked around colleges where it's a lot of people. I will put this up. Uh, let me get that in the frame. That is our entire front office staff, including interns in 1994 in Birmingham. Now, Michael's in the photo. Actually, he's not. We had a cardboard cutout. So Michael is actually in, in, the, in the photo. A little bit. Is he? I didn't catch that at first. Yeah, he's right behind me, actually, in, in that photo. Right. And that's our entire front office staff, okay? And so what we were able to accomplish with those people was so, nothing short of miraculous for us and, and, and special. We've all been kind of revisiting that here in the last few weeks. And uh, it's tremendous fun. It's always good to look back at it. And uh, you know, happy that he's moved on to, to, you know, what was a finish of a great career and now is an NBA owner. And I'm glad he had some of the nice things to say about his baseball experience and playing in Birmingham. Rise and shine. You're dead to me. And you are, because I'm out. And we please accept this route. Absolutely, I will. If there was ever an athlete that transcended sports, it was Michael Jordan. So from sports, we go to pop culture now. And Megan, before we dive into our main stories, have you seen this yet on social media? I have. I've I, seen some good ones. I think I have the best one ever, and it's gotten no likes or retweets. What is it? The Backstreet Goys. <laughs> That's funny. And it's probably true. I don't think they were Jewish. What, what is a goy? Goyim. It's, it's Yiddish for non-Jewish people. That is so on brand. I cannot even. I'm wearing a great shirt, by the way. 
I, this is not, this is totally coincidental. I it wasn't even, this is my Jordan Jumpman dunking rabbi shirt. What does it say? It says, uh, just do it. <laughs> Oh my God. One of my favorites. <laughs> okay, Backstreet Goy. I'm the Goy. So anyway. <laughs> Dying. That's incredible. Yeah. You should wear that shirt when you go on your dates with your hinge ladies. <laughs> Please do that. Please. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be a talking point. That's for sure. Hey, you always need somewhere to start. Icebreakers. <laughs> um, anyway, let's dive into, uh, let's dive into Aunt Becky. She did a bad thing. Uh, what do you got? Oh, what a time. So the college admissions scandal strikes again. Lori Laughlin and her husband, Missioni, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. They finally pleaded guilty that they uh, funneled, what, like $500,000 to a charity at USC to pretend that their, that their daughter was a rower. Um, yeah, I don't know what she, she was saying. a fact-checkable thing, by the way. Well, they found out the charity was fake, the FBI. I gotta, like, have the article in front of me to discuss well, like, it. There's a roster. Like, she wasn't on it. Right. They Well, apparently in an email chain, this guy was like, I need a picture of your daughter, like, on a rowing machine in athletic clothes. And they were like, yeah, no problem. We got it. And the daughter, her name's Olivia Jade. She's an Instagram influencer. She has, like, a million followers. It's unbelievable. Um, so, like, yeah, they, they pleaded guilty. Uh, finally, which is hilarious because Felicity Huffman, uh, pleaded guilty like a year ago, did two weeks in jail and like, I think she got out early. I think she was only there for like a couple days. Um, and as a Desperate Housewives fan, I was a little bummed that Felicity went to that level, but you know, whatever things happen. So yeah, Aunt Becky is going to do roughly, I think two months in jail and like a hundred community service hours and pay like a $150,000 fine. Her husband has a similar um similar situation and they're going to be sentenced in august how do you feel about two months oh man aunt becky is not going to handle jail she is not Lori laughlin is not cut out for jail i'm I telling you right stewart, now I think martha stewart did just fine so i don't know I just, meant, I just meant from a length standpoint is it Honestly, I, I wouldn't say that sentencing is my forte, so I can't give you a good answer to that. Well, Two months seems like, honestly, I think it's not enough because they've so, for so long, they denied it as opposed to just owning up and being like, yeah, we like used our privilege and we screwed up. Yeah, I just like, I don't want to compare one crime to another and, you know, I, you really have to dive into the specifics of this case in particular, but like, there are people in jail for years because they had, like, a dime bag of weed. Years. Like, I don't want to get on, like, my social justice warrior, like, pedestal here, but, and I think that was one of the interesting things that was trending on Twitter this morning was, like, people were, like, two months? And, and if you want to say that, all right, well, two months is appropriate, well, like, I think then, you ha like, we have to have the conversation about adjusting other things in perspective. You mean there's a problem in our justice system? A little bit. Oh, huh. wasn't aware. So. No. That's but, a good point. It's a fair point, 100%. I'm with you on that one. Um, yeah, I, it's probably not enough considering the fact, but I mean, look, this was, she's not gonna be there for two months, I guarantee you. She'll get out early oh, somehow. Oh. So, you know, at the end of the day, you hope that they, learn something from this uh i don't think they did though no my favorite part by the way if you go and look up some of like the articles covering this apparently they pleaded guilty on a zoom call with the judge and there were kept being like internet glitches and like Lori laughlin and her lawyer were muted and like they couldn't hear them and like the judge was muted and it was apparently like a, a crap shoot and like, i said not guilty not not guilty it was not guilty for 45 no, no, minutes. No, no, not guilty. TMI? Too much information. It's just easier to say TMI. I used to say don't go there, but that's lame. All right, TMI this week, Megan McEwen. We are going back into the dating realm. Well, I feel like we already covered TMI a little bit on this episode, but uh, let's go back into the dating world. Uh, worst pickup line you've ever had used on you is go. 
I had to think about this. I didn't have much time to think about it. Um, two, two of my favorite things. One, I've had a couple, you're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. And you know, that's not true. How do you know that's not true? You should have more self-confidence. No. Well, and my favorite thing to say back to them is, well, you must not get out much. And it always throws them for a loop. They don't know what to say after that because I thought it was going to work. And I'm like, no, I've named like 75 freaking gorgeous women in Hollywood. Hello. Maybe Jessica you're the type. Alba, Cindy Crawford. Maybe she's not their type. Gigi Hadid. Ah, I don't know. I keep going. I and then my other favorite is. one is when their guys are like, oh, I bet I could beat you in basketball. I bet you I could beat you in a, a shooting contest. I'm like, no, you couldn't. Like, Were you a good shooter? Uh, apparently. <laughs> like, that's my favorite thing that they think that like, oh, because I'm a boy, I can beat you. And it's like supposed to be this pickup line, but I take offense to it. Yeah, good, like, way to, good way to get yourself in with somebody is to tell them that immediately you're better than them. Ooh, last thing on New Year's Eve. Um, so my dad's team, Northwestern, beat Maryland. Upset Maryland is a big, huge win for us. And um, I was at some fr a friend's house for New Year's Eve, and um, they work for my dad and everything. So, like, we had the game up on the TV. There's, like, this massive party, like, with people we didn't know, but, like, it was my friend's apartment, so we had the Northwestern Maryland game up. So I was sitting there just watching it on mute, and this guy came down and sat next to me and scooted over to me, and he goes, why are you watching this lame game? No one likes women's basketball anyways. And now you're married. And I looked at him and I said, that's actually my dad is the coach. And he was like. Oh. So good. All right, Megan, I'll see you next week. Bye, friend.